in the stars' handiwork I see. On the wind he speaks with majesty. Though he ruleth over land and sea, what is that to me? I will celebrate nativity, for it has a place in history. Sure he came to set his people free, what was that to me? Then by faith I met him face to face, and I felt the wonder of his grace. Then I knew that he was more than just a God who didn't care, who lives away up there and now he walks beside me day by day, ever watching o'er me lest I stray, helping me to find the narrow way. He's everything to me. Now he walks beside me day by day, helping me to find the narrow way. He's everything to me. Open your Bible with me this, uh, this evening to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16. And uh, we're going to talk about the differences in churches. And before we get into the text and the sermon, I want to use a couple uh, thoughts that uh, have happened. I've got a, a number of real good friends that uh, have struggled with... Uh, the churches that they were members of, and and there were some things that happened that uh, weren't very good. And I'm not justifying uh, what the pastors did and how they handled certain circumstances. But um, <clears throat> one brother in particular that I love very much, <clears throat> he left a true New Testament church that teaches the whole counsel of God and he joined a Baptist church that is an Armenian church. And when I say an Armenian church, I mean that uh, they teach uh, decisional regeneration, talk people down the aisle, you know, people raising up their hands, trying to, you know, get, get con, uh, professions of faith. And they make merchandise out of people. Now, I know their pastor, and I love their pastor. He's, in a lot of ways, he's a good man, but he just does not understand grace. He does not understand it. Now, this brother and his wife are members of that church, and uh, we had some long discussions before he joined that church, and he said, well, what about you? He said, could you join an Armenian church? And I said, no, brother, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you very clearly. Before I would join an Armenian Baptist church, I wouldn't go to church. I could not go and listen to a man make merchandise out of people and preach doctrine that is not in the Word of God. And, you know, he, he got a little bit upset with me, but he, we're still good friends. And I still love him. I'd do anything in the world for him. And uh, I could cite other examples where people have you know, decided that they no longer wanted to be a part of a church that stood for the truth, and they just went out and found them a Baptist church, and because of whatever, it could have been a Southern Baptist church, and uh, I know there's a lot of good folks in Southern Baptist churches, I know there are a lot of saved people, uh, and I've had opportunities to pastor Southern Baptist churches, but I never would. I never would accept a call 
uh, to even go and preach in view of a call because I am not a Southern Baptist. Uh, and there are reasons why. Because I believe that I'm not saying that all Southern Baptists are this way, but a number of Southern Baptists compromise uh, many uh, important doctrines of the Bible. And we want to talk about some of those things. I took a, a publication from a, a Southern Baptist preacher, and he wrote this article, and I kind of went through it, and, uh, and I, I wanted to kind of share some things, and I hope that it'll be a blessing to you. Now, I, first of all, to anybody listening, I don't want you to get offended and hurt at me because I love you. And I, I'm not doing this to be hateful or to be mean-spirited. But I'm doing it because I think that people ought to know there's a difference in churches. And uh, if we know those things and we continue to do it, then that's between you and God. I'll still love you. You'll still be my brother or sister in Christ. And, uh, and that's between you and God. But uh, these are things that we should understand in a, loving, in a loving manner. People can disagree on things. You know, you can disagree about the elements of the Lord's Supper. You can disagree about a head covering or not. You can disagree about, you know, there's a number of different issues. You can be a trichotomist or a dichotomist. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of things that people can uh, disagree on where the Bible doesn't come out and say this is absolutely how it is. But then there are some things that the Bible is very clear about. Now here in Matthew 16, one of the very famous scriptures that uh, we have of Jesus and he is talking to his disciples. And Simon Peter uh, has some questions and uh, and he has some questions also for the disciples. And he begins by asking them, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? That's in verse 13. And they said that some say that you're John the Baptist. Well, we know that John had, had baptized Jesus, and John had gone to or Jesus had gone to John the Baptist. He had walked some 70 miles to get Baptist baptism from John the Baptist. Somebody, I picked up hitchhiking the other day, and, and he told me that it didn't matter what kind of church you went to. And, and uh, I asked him, I said, who did Jesus go to? And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, who did he get baptized by? He said, John. I said, John the what? John the Methodist, John the Presbyterian. He said, no, John the Baptist. I said, that's right, he was a Baptist. And I said, uh, God gave him that name. And Baptists have been known in their distinction from the time of Christ. Now, let me make no bones about it. I believe that the first church that Jesus Christ started was a Baptist church. All of the people had Baptist baptism. Now, don't misunderstand me. Understand me. I'm not saying you have to be a Baptist to be saved. I've had that lie told on me a thousand times. You're saved by grace through faith in Christ. But after you're saved and you are scripturally baptized and you become uh, what uh, church you're associated with and if you're in a big church that compromises and takes liberties with the word of God then you're in a compromising church if you're in a church that doesn't it'll probably be a smaller church because the world is not going to flock after the truth now it doesn't necessarily all the time mean that you're going to be smaller but in many cases, it is. Jesus had a small assembly. For a while, he only had 12. And then one betrayed him. Now, on the day of Pentecost, they had 3,000. Then a little later, 4,000 saved. But those people all went back home. And on the day of Pentecost, they had 120 members. 
on that particular day. Now, I'm sure when they had other services, they may have only had 12, 15 at a time. Maybe they even had less than that at times. But they were organized by Christ, and He gave authority for them to begin the first church that was organized. Now, He goes on, and He said unto them, in verse 15 again, Whom say you that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered, and he said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. Um, and he said, Flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And that word Barjona, I've, I've been working on a whole sermon on that. Verse 18, And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Now notice those words. Now, the name, the Greek name for Peter, meant a small stone. Peter was a small stone in that church. Peter was not a pope. Uh, there is absolutely no authority or documentation that you can contend that Peter was a pope. He never was a pope. Peter was a, an apostle. He was never a pope. The first pope didn't come along until over 300 years later. And that was when Constantine, and some may go a little bit earlier than Constantine with Pope Gregory, but uh, that's at least 300 years after Christ. And that's when the Roman Catholic Church began to form and to teach false doctrine rather than teaching the truth. And always it was the Lord's churches against false churches. Roman Catholic churches were false. The Lord's churches were true. And there is a trail of blood, whether you want to believe it or not, it's all through the Bible. And we even have a book here that we give out copies of from time to time called The Trail of Blood that traces our history of Baptists back to the first church in Jerusalem. Now, even if I could not prove it historically, I believe it's true because here's what Jesus said. Verse 18, I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock. Now he's referring to a rock different than Peter. You are Peter, but upon this rock, which is Christ, that's the word, the Greek word Petra, which means the large, massive stone. I will what? I will build my church. His church would be built upon Christ and the gates of hell. Now, if you underline in your Bible, underline the gates of hell. Basically, what that means is that the unseen world would not prevail against His assembly. It would always be in existence. The gates of hell, that word there, hell, is the word Hades, which means unseen world would not prevail. That word prevail means it would not overcome it. It would not destroy it. So, based upon this promise, Jesus is saying that He would build His church and it would not go out of existence. That even everything that the unseen world of darkness could do against it would not stop it. And then he said, And I will give unto thee, talking now directly back to that assembly, that rock, that Petra, not, or, uh, not Petros, but Petra, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That shows us that the churches, true churches, that love the word of God and remain true to our Lord Jesus Christ, are given great power.
power upon this earth. They have the keys of the kingdom. They have the gospel. They have prayer. They have the Holy Spirit. The Lord is working in and through His churches and through His people. If there's any place in the world where the Lord is going to be working, it's going to be in His churches. And He said that whatever you bind will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose will be loosed. Now, we talk about the differences Many people around the world take great comfort in practicing a religion that there are over uh, 4,000 recognized religions around the world. And there are common religious groups, uh, some that are known as Baptist. And in that Baptist group, there are American Baptists, there are Independent Baptists, there are Free Will Baptists, there are there's every kind of Baptist you can think of. I think Baptist is all you need. Some people say, well, we should say missionary Baptist. If you're a Baptist, you're a missionary. If you're really a Baptist, you are a missionary. We don't have to put missionary in there. Some say, well, we've got to be landmark Baptist. If you're a true Baptist, you are landmark because you believe in the authority of the church and you believe in the landmarks that Christ has laid. So Baptist is all we need. And as a Baptist, the one we want to glorify is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there are others called Southern Baptist. People often see these groups as the same. But there are big differences that set them apart. There are big differences between Southern Baptist and our kind of Baptist. Each have their own backgrounds and their own religious ideas. If you're wondering what sets these groups apart, well, this is what we're going to talk about. We're going to explore some of these uh, characteristics that show the differences. Uh, one man wrote uh, from a, uh, this is a Southern Baptist preacher. He says that, uh, uh, the Southern Baptist Church was started when people rebelled against the Church of England. Then these people started calling for religious reform. So he don't believe that Baptists were ever around until after the Church of England and these other churches are basically after the Reformation in the 17th century. And most of the Southern Baptists believe that John Smythe, they'll call him, or John Smith, was the first Baptist. But all you have to do is a little historical research to find out that the first Baptist church in America was started by Dr. Clark, and he came from England with a charter, and he came to America and established the first Baptist church in America. Roger Williams uh, started another church that he called himself a seeker, so he really wasn't a true Baptist. Uh, but some called him a Baptist. But those were long before uh, that time. And uh, if, uh, you know, if that's what they believed, then they, their church was started after the Reformation. It's not even as old as the Catholic Church. Well, we don't believe that. We believe the Lord's assembly started in the ministry of Jesus when he prayed all night and then he called the twelve. And that's when he organized the first church. They had a treasure in the book of Acts. Uh, they had a secretary. They knew all the names. And when Judas fell by transgression, they appointed one to take the place of Judas. They had deacons in the, in the church, and they did the work of the Lord. They took up offerings, they helped the needy, they did mission work, and as you read the book of Acts, you will see them constantly working under the authority of a church. They report back to the church at Jerusalem, or the church at Antioch. 
They were all under church authority. You see, when you go out and start doing the Lord's work and you have no church authority, you are just going freelance. And that is not real mission work. Real mission work is done under the arm and the authority of a local church. That way the church has authority over you and you have to submit to what it believes and practices like every other member. Now, the Southern Baptist view, uh, as many people know, uh, this man wrote that they emphasized baptism and they wanted local church autonomy and leadership for all the believers. And many early Baptist people fled to the American colonies and Baptist groups started popping up amongst the colonies. Now our view is that our kind of Baptists are distinguished, although not necessarily distinctive. Uh, their convictions, they, they have certain convictions they hold in common, but there are some that clearly set us apart. And I'm going to give you a few of those. Now, we believe the supreme authority of the Bible in all matters of faith and practice. And here are some Bible verses that show the authority of Scripture. 2 Timothy 3 tells us in verse 16 that all Scripture is given by God, is inspired by God, is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto all good work. But the main point is that all Scripture is inspired. It's God-breathed. Scripture is God's Word. Now, the Bible don't just contain God's Word. The Bible is God's Word. Some Southern Baptists, and there's quite a few of them, will say that the Bible contains the Word of God, but that all of it is not the Word of God. We have a very distinct position from many of them. There's some other scripture. Peter says in 2 Peter 1.21 that no prophecy came by private interpretation or by the, the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. They were moved by the Spirit of God. And even Jesus in John 16 and verse 13 told His disciples, He told them that He must go away. But He said, If I don't go away, the Comforter will not come. But when I go away... The Comforter will come to you, and He will guide you into all truth. And so we believe that the Holy Spirit, as you read your Bible, and as you follow Christ, the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. We want all truth. We don't just want part of it. We want it all. We don't shy from any of it. You know, one of the one of the things that you'll you'll I was I know I know Kathy understands this, but before I met Kathy, uh, I was close with a young lady that was a Southern Baptist, and uh, <clears throat> they were big in their Southern Baptist church. It was actually in Alexandria, Kentucky, and uh, she wanted me to come and go to church with her, so I drove all the way to Alexandria. And uh, I went to church with her, and we got in Sunday school, and there was an adult Sunday school class, and we got ready to start class, and guess what? A woman came out to teach the class. And I looked at her, and I said, you got a woman that teaches the men? And she said, what's wrong with that? And I said, let me tell you something. You, you don't know your Bible. You're not reading the Word of God. The woman is to be silent and not to usurp authority over the man, but to be in subjection. I got up and walked out. 
She squalled. I can't believe you're leaving. I said, listen, I'm a Baptist. And I'm not going to compromise what I believe. I'm not going to come to a church where a woman is standing up usurping authority and teaching the men, adult men. That's not scriptural. Now that's not my sermon. But we will, you know that there are at least three direct references in the Bible to women being silent in the assembly. Now I think that's talking about women teaching. Now, I'm not if a woman says amen or she whispers a prayer request to a pastor, I don't think that's got anything to do with that. Or if a woman sings a song, there's some that go off the deep end. They won't even let women sing or do anything like that. We're not like that. But we do clearly believe that women are not to preach or to usurp authority. Now they can teach the other women. They can teach the children, and they can do those things, and God tells us that. But uh, we love all people, and we want to do what God says rather than what people want us to do. Now, another thing that we, we believe in proper baptism. Now, you, you take uh, many Southern Baptists and liberal Baptists, uh, They'll take any baptism. It don't have to be Baptist. They'll take Methodist baptism. They'll take Campbellite baptism. Uh, you know, I, I've, uh, I've seen this happen. I've talked to people and knew them, and they told me they joined a certain, certain Baptist church, and I said, well, were you baptized? And they said, no, they took my baptism. I said, were you baptized? And they said, well, I was, I was baptized in a holiness church. And they took that baptism. Now, we won't do that. We won't take that baptism because we believe that baptism is to be done with proper authority for the proper reason, for the proper mode. It's to be immersion. And it's not in order to be saved, but it's because you're already saved. Some of the scripture that we could talk about, uh, Acts 2.41, then they that gladly received his word were baptized and they were added unto the church. They were not church members until they were baptized. Now, when you're saved, when you repent and believe the gospel and you're born again, you become a part of the family of God. That does not make you a part of the Lord's church. You become a member through scriptural baptism or a letter from a sister church. If you're in a church that takes alien baptism and takes open communion, that church is in open rebellion to God. You ought to get out of it as quick as you can and find you a church that doesn't do that. Now I might make some people mad, but let me tell you I love you. I really do. And I'm trying to tell you what's true. And, and Peter tells us uh, this uh, in 1 Peter chapter 3. Uh, he reminds us that we have been uh, bought by the precious blood of Christ. And he explains that baptism is a like figure, that it does not save us, but it is the answer of a good conscience toward God. That's what baptism is all about. And uh, in Matthew 26, uh, or excuse me, 28, where Jesus deals particularly with baptism, and he says this in verse 19 of uh, Matthew 28, Go ye therefore, and he's talking to the church, and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Whenever we baptize, we baptize in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Now, if you say Holy Spirit, that's fine. Same thing. The word ghost is the Greek word pneuma, which means spirit. Uh, but uh, he says you're to do this, and that's to the church. The church has that authority. And he says, go ye. Look at that in verse 19. Go is a charge. 
Ye, who is the ye? It's the church. How do we know that? Well, look back at verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. That's the ye. Make, mark, mature. Make disciples. That's a work of the Holy Spirit. Our job is to preach the gospel. You mark them with scriptural baptism, and then they're matured through the teaching of the Word of God. 1 Timothy 3.15 says the church is the pillar and the ground of the truth. That's where you deposit the truth. That's where the depository lies. Is right here in the assembly. No other place on earth is the depository of truth. Your colleges, your Bible colleges are not the depository of truth. Because Bible colleges come and go. But churches continue to exist. The Lord never promised a Bible college perpetuity. He promised His churches perpetuity. Then He says, You teach them to observe all things, verse 20, Whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. The Lord said He'd be with us. Now, I was going to go to Romans 6, but our time is just about gone. Churches composed of baptized believers only. Uh, and, and we don't have the time to do this, but if you go to Mark 16, uh, verses 15 through 16, Acts 8, 12 through 36, and then Acts 16, 31 and 33, and Acts 18, 8, all state that only born-again believers in Jesus Christ are to be baptized. We don't baptize babies. That's called pedo-baptism, infant baptism. We don't do that. Why? Because babies can't believe. Or they, they just can't believe. They're not old enough. We don't christen babies. Now, we dedicate children... When mothers have young babies, we'll bring them up before the congregation and we'll pray for them. and We'll ask God to have mercy on them and save them. But we don't christen them. Why? There's not an example of that in the Bible nowhere. So when you go to that false church you go to and they sprinkle water on those babies, they are committing something that is heretical. It's not biblical. Now, salvation by grace. Now, I read this article at length that this Southern Baptist preacher wrote, and he said this, and, I, and I'm not going to quote it, but I'm going to tell you basically what he said. He says that everybody has a choice, and so salvation is your decision. It's left to you. He didn't say anything about it being God's decision. But I'm here to tell you it is God who worketh in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. You can't just say, well, you know what? I think I'm going to get saved. God has to work in you. The Holy Spirit has to use the Word. Paul explains it in Ephesians chapter 2. If you read verses 1 through 5, he said it's after you heard the gospel, the Word of salvation, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Salvation by grace. Now here we're not ashamed of the doctrines of grace. We believe in total depravity. We believe in unconditional election. We believe in a limited atonement. We believe in irresistible grace. And we believe in the perseverance and the preservation of the saints. Now some people say, well, that's a bunch of heresy. No, it's not. It's in the Bible. Paul believed it. Jesus believed it. All of the apostles believed it. They taught it. Now, we also believe in whosoever will. Let him come. 
We believe that any man who will come, let him come and take of the water of life freely. You say, well, you can't believe both of those. Yes, I do. I believe it's of grace, but I believe that it's whosoever will. And God's the one that decides whosoever will. I want to tell you, the day I got saved, I would have never, never embarrassed myself like that, humanly speaking, in front of all those people and come up there and wept like a little baby and cried and all those things that I did and repented before God. You know what? I had, I had an image to protect. I was a tough guy. But I learned something that day. I learned that God can break your heart whenever He wants to. And God can, can do in you what you can't do. And God can turn your will around. God can do things that will absolutely transform your life. Now, we reject baptismal regeneration. We reject it completely in all forms. We reject it in Catholicism. We reject it in Campbellites. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that it is not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Titus chapter 3, verses 4 and 7 he even says right there that if it were of works, then it wouldn't be of grace. But because it's not of works, it's all of grace. And Paul brings out the same thing in Romans 5, 1. Therefore, being freely justified, there is no condemnation, therefore, to those who are in Christ Jesus. Obviously, uh, Baptism wasn't necessary for the thief on the cross. And then the Campbellites will say, well, he was saved in a different dispensation. And they've got no proof for that. There's, there's no evidence for that. The dying thief said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. He didn't even have a chance to get baptized. But he was saved. The Lord's Supper is symbolic. The elements of the Lord's Supper are symbolic. When we break the bread and we take the fruit of the vine, those do not become the actual blood and flesh of Christ. Now, Southern Baptists don't believe that, but Catholics do. They call it transubstantiation. They say that when the priest breaks the bread, they'll, they'll have a little handkerchief under there because they don't want the flesh of Christ to fall on the floor. Now, how foolish is that? And then when a woman bends over to take it, they'll put something here because they don't want the flesh of Christ to fall down into her bosom. That's total ignorance. That bread is not the flesh of Christ. And that blood is not the, that fruit of the vine is not the blood of Christ. It's symbolic. It represents, he said, as long as you do this, you do show the Lord's death until He comes again. 1 Corinthians 11, 24 and 25 makes that very clear, that it's symbolic. Matthew 26, Jesus said that the bread is my body and the cup is the blood of my covenant which is shed for many. 1 Corinthians 11, 24 and 25, as I mentioned, uh, where Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, makes it clear that it's symbolic. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six: as oft as you do eat this bread and drink this cup, uh, you're, you're basically proclaiming my death. You're remembering and you're proclaiming my death until I come again. 1 Corinthians 10, 17, Because there is one, one loaf, we who then are many are one body, for we all share of that one loaf. That is, as we break the bread as one body, you, each church, each local church, 
takes the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is to be, uh, it's not to be for anybody else, only members, closed communion. It's not open, it's not close, it's closed. Only for members are to partake of the Lord's Supper. And uh, now, this one man went on to say that, uh, of course, we believe in soul liberty. We believe in church authority and matters concerning the church, baptism, Lord's Supper, mission work, and we believe only men are called to preach. What this man wrote, the Baptist faith grew and started into different branches. And he said, uh, the Southern Baptist has a dark history involving slavery. In the 1800s, debates over slavery caused a rift between Baptist groups. And the Southern Baptist churches had most of its locations in slave states, and they supported slavery. Now, they have repented of that, and they have denounced slavery, so let's be honest with that. Uh, but in the beginning, they did not. They were on the wrong side of history. But many, I've read the history of many true Baptist churches who stood against slavery. And they were not a part of supporting slavery. What would you have done had you lived during that time? Would you have had the fortitude to say, I'm going to reject slavery? I hope I would have. Because owning a human being is wrong. And making a slave of another person is, is a horrible thing to do. And uh, we, uh, the fundamental beliefs of God's people is key to how they experience their life. We believe the Bible is the direct Word of God and this means it is the ultimate guide for how to live and how to practice our faith as Baptist. The Bible is our guide. Baptists use the Bible to live by, to give them information about God's character. Do you know that one of the common things that Southern Baptists will do is they They've had this promotion for years of telling people to accept Jesus. Do you know that there's not a single injunction in the Bible where Jesus ever said, or the apostles, to accept Jesus? What do you accept about Him? The Bible says you preach repentance and faith. I don't go around telling people, oh, will you please accept Jesus? If you'll just accept Jesus... Then, then you'll be saved. No. You've got to repent of your sins. And you must be born again. If you live the same way that you've always lived, you're not saved. You've made a profession, but it's not real. I, had, I did that for years in my life. I didn't live my life for, for the Lord. The Lord was the last thing on my mind. But I believe if a child of God is saved and they love the Lord, they'll see that, that we are to be encouraged to study the Bible deeper and deeper and understand the Word of God and not be satisfied with just this surface fluff. We're not about impressing people or having some big building, or some big numbers, or having the approval of the local newspaper or the police department. We're about honoring our Lord Jesus Christ. See, I still got about three pages to go, but I'll have to quit there. Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord, that we've had this time to study your word. Help me, Lord, to always remember that I need to preach in love. Sometimes, Lord, these things can really weigh us down heavy. We see so many people compromising the word of God, and 
it breaks our hearts and we, we wish that people would, would love you and serve you the way they should. I wish I would, Lord. I wish that I could be more like Christ. And I pray you'd help us not to think more highly like Brother Wilson read in his devotion, that we're not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought, but to think soberly and righteously and to humble ourselves before you because we know, Lord, that had it not been for you saving us, that we would still be lost and on our way to hell. Thank you for having mercy upon our souls. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand together, Brother Chapman. I'm